Welcome to the channel if you've never been here before. This is Movie Readings, where I take entire Hollywood scripts and read them from start to finish right here on YouTube. Sometimes these take hours to make, so it could really help me out if you would consider subscribing and comment below with what you would like the next movie reading to be. Darkness. A sound slowly builds. The rhythmic rocking of a train's wheels over railroad tracks. Coulter jolts awake. Sunlight hits his face. He blinks. A stunned beat. He's disoriented. Slowly, he turns his head to one side. Passengers filling most of the seats. Office workers on their morning commute into a city. Turning the other way, he's confronted with a widow. Trees flash by, splitting the rising sunlight into a hypnotic strobe pattern. Coulter looks to be 30 years old, a military buzz cut, a disciplined physique, lean and spare, almost gaunt, skin burnished by years of desert sandstorms and equatorial sun. His expression, prematurely aged by combat, is perpetually wary, sometimes predatory accustomed to trouble. Despite his military bearings, Colton wears a button-down shirt and navy sports coat. On his wrist is a digital watch. It reads 7.40 a.m. He swallows. A strange, creeping panic. He has no idea where he is. The train hurls straight at us. A new angle, skimming along as the train twists and turns, sucking up track, feet, yards, miles of it. Beneath it, the curving rails, which the rushing train barely seems to touch, they vibrate with an eerie, dulcimer hum. Coulter hasn't moved. By his side, he sees a canvas messenger bag. Is this his? Tentatively, he lifts the edge of the bag to look inside. A red apple rolls against two library books. The bag's leather name tag reads, Sean Fentress. It's not coming back to him. This whole experience is starting to freak him out. He catches the scent of something. A passenger walks by with a steaming cup of coffee. Ktsch! Two rows back, an overweight man opens a can of soda. Sitting opposite Coulter, facing him, is a woman in her late twenties, Christina. In contrast to the corporate suits around her, her appearance is thrift store funky. Black nail polish, dark lipstick, black hair with blue streaks, a button-down blouse edged in black funeral lace with silver skull and bones cufflinks. She's busy writing in a journal. Ma'am? Nothing. Excuse me, ma'am? She looks up, blank stare. What is this? What's what? Where am I? Christina looks out the window. Almost at Newark? Goes back to her journal. Where's Newark? A city? It's more of a hellhole. But Coulter still doesn't understand. He gets up. Nausea slams into him. He hangs onto the seat. Whoa! I think I'm gonna puke. Christina gestures, alarmed. Okay, bathroom's that way. Coulter looks down the aisle, hesitating. Go, seriously. Coulter eases himself into the aisle, totters down the length of the car until he finds the restroom. The door is locked. The latch reads, occupied. Bracing himself, he lurches forward into the second car. He freezes. It's a mirror image of the first car but the passengers are different. Beside him, there's a small door. Thinking it's the bathroom, he opens it and finds a conductor's compartment, a cramped office with chairs and surveillance monitors. Ticket? A heavyset conductor stands in the aisle. A jangling of keys. Coulter just stares at him, dazed. May I see your ticket? The last thing on his mind. Bewildered, he searches his pockets. I don't think I... Have to write you up, then. He pulls out a citation pad. 
Is this? From inside his sports coat, he pulls out a train ticket. The conductor snips his ticket and brushes past. Wait a sec. I'm a little out of it here. Where is this train headed? New York. Penn Station. New York? Why would he be going to New York? How can this be happening? Fear starts to grip him as the hallucination simply continues. Do you know where I got on? The conductor examines his ticket again. Princeton Junction? Where's that? About ten minutes back. But I've never been to Princeton Junction. See, I don't remember waking up or, or buying a ticket or getting on the train or anything else. It's just a blank. Lucky you. The jaded conductor moves on. Coulter is alone with his confusion. He takes a deep breath. The nausea has eased slightly. Talking to himself, Okay, you're going to figure this out. Entering the first car again, the rows of passengers, there must be at least 40 people. As he walks back up the aisle, he looks from face to face. A pale computer engineer reviews some documents. A 40-something secretary does a crossword puzzle. Derek, a stockbroker type, talks on his cell phone. Trust me, by one o'clock, the bridge is going to be jammed. A college student, slumped against a window, eyes shut, listens to an MP3 player. An old man with a faded wool suit clutches a cane. A backpacker, female, European, 20s, hiking boots, examines a guidebook. A dowdy office manager type sorts supermarket coupons into a tabbed file box. An African-American executive reads a newspaper. None of them pays any attention to Coulter. A whoosh of air. He turns to an air conditioning vent. The hiss of air sounds sinister, like the exhalation of a creature. A scrape, he looks to see. A woman filing her nails. Coulter cringes. Every detail, every sensory impression seems heightened near the point of overload. He reaches Christina again, eases back in the seat across from her. She writes in her journal, ignoring him. There's something else in his sports coat, a wallet. He turns it over a few times, inspecting it. He pulls out a driver's license. Another man's face is in the photo. The name on the license reads, Sean Fentress, the same name as on the messenger bag. The street address on the license, 58 Alexander Road, Princeton Junction, New Jersey. Sean Fentress? Who the hell is that? And why does he have this guy's wallet? He leans forward to speak with Christina again. Ma'am? She lowers her journal, annoyed. We see she hasn't been writing, but drawing. A well-executed sketch of a face. Why do you keep calling me ma'am? How old do you think I am, anyway? I'm having a little problem here. I'm trying not to freak out, but I think something has happened to me. Like what? Like total memory loss? Complete. I don't know how I got here. So you drank too much last night. So did I. Unfortunately, I remember the whole thing. That's not it. See, I'm a pilot. I fly helicopters in Iraq. I'm in the army. She waits for more, as if he's telling a joke. I was on a mission. Right before I woke up here, I was in the middle of a mission. Wavering, unsure of himself, his memories. Boy, you really did drink a lot last night. I'm telling you the truth. Now approaching Newark Station. Newark Station, next stop. The train begins to slow down. A few people begin to get up. The platform of Newark Station slides into view. These aren't my clothes. And this wallet here... He holds up the driver's license. One final attempt to convince her. You see this? This isn't me. Of course it is. What? Take a look in the mirror, good sir. The mirror. She goes back to her sketchbook. Determined not to be interrupted again, anxiety ripples through Coulter. This can't be happening. The train lurches to a stop. Newark Station. Coulter gets up, 
Through the window, a few passengers disembark onto the platform. Derek, the old man, the college kid, and Guzman, a Middle Eastern man, who hurries past all of them toward the station building. Coulter only half notices all of this. He's intent on reaching the train's bathroom, the door of which is now open. All aboard, doors are closing. Christina watches Coulter go, curious. This is a New York-bound train. Next stop, New York, Penn Station. The train begins moving. Coulter reaches the bathroom. A fluorescent light flickers on as Coulter shuts the door. He's in a tiny space with prefab restroom fixtures in stainless steel. He shouts in surprise and recoils backwards. His eyes lock on the mirror. Staring back is Sean Fentress's face, not his own. He's frozen there, heart pounding. Seized by cosmic panic, he slaps himself in the face, hard. Wake up! The restroom rattles and tilts with the motions of the train, obliging him to hang on. This is not a dream, at least not one he can wake from. The other guy's face stares back at him and blinks when he blinks. Warehouses go by in a blur. The train is entering New Jersey's industrial zones on the outskirts of New York City. From her seat, Christina stares at the messenger bag which Coulter left behind, and then up at the closed restroom door. We cut to the bathroom door. Her hand knocks. Hey, are you okay in there? Coulter sits on the closed toilet seat, head buried in his hands, scared, desperate for it all to end. Christina is holding Coulter's messenger bag. She talks through the closed door. You left your bag on the seat, which is a flagrant violation of rail security, leaving a suspicious package behind and all that. I probably saved you a huge fine. No answer. I'll just leave it right out here for you. She places the bag beside the door. She hesitates at the door. The oddness of this situation. Coulter stares into the mirror at the stranger's face, practically catatonic at this point, and then her voice. If it'll help you remember, you've been riding this train every morning for three months. Her words rouse him. Three months? Christina is walking back down the aisle. The car rocks to one side as an express train flashes by on the opposite tracks going the other way. A blur and a whoosh and it's gone. On the verge of opening the bathroom door, Coulter hears a metallic rattling. Two screws are rattling around in the sink. Coulter picks up the screws, turns it over and over in his hand. What are they doing in the sink? He looks up. An overhead ventilation panel has been pried open. Above it is the darkness of a crawl space. Something is sitting up there. From outside comes a train horn. Through the window... A freight train is passing the other way, a moving wall of metal boxcars and liquid tankers. Coulter looks up into the crawl space. He can't quite see the object up there. Moving carefully into the tiny space, he stands up on the toilet. Grabbing onto the ventilation panel, he wrenches it all the way open, and then pulls himself uncomfortably upward. On tiptoes, he looks into the crawl space and discovers a massive bomb. It's an enormous device. Several large canisters tied together, full of sloshing liquid. Barely discernible behind wires and gaffing tape is a cell phone, the bomb's detonator. Jesus! Running footsteps from outside. Commotion. An alarm sounds. The bomb's cell phone rings. The device's circuit closes and the bomb explodes in Coulter's face with a huge and deafening force, instantly killing him. The fireball rips through the car, killing Christina and all the others. Fuel lines explode in the other cars in a horrendous chain reaction. The fire is spectacularly bright, lighting up the windows of the row house apartments facing the tracks. Nearby trees incinerate, mere matchsticks amid sheets of flames. On the row houses, an aluminum door molding begins to melt in the intense heat. One of the freight cars, loaded down with coal, shuddering from the blast, 
wobbles a few yards and then pitches over, rolling off the rails, tipping right off the elevated tracks. It falls through the air and smashes into the middle of a traffic intersection below with a shattering force. The cascade of explosions continues. Large portions of both trains are annihilated, while the heat reduces the heavy gauge steel rails back to the elemental molten ore. And then, an odd sound like a balloon losing air, or machinery winding down, as we dissolve to brilliant white. All sounds cease. For exactly one-third of a second, a mysterious pattern of lines appears, like metal rods, perhaps. Radiating outward, it makes no sense. An abstract pattern, and then it's gone. Many will not even see it. Now there is only darkness, nothingness, seconds pass. The click of an intercom switching on. This is Beleaguered Castle. We're very close on Coulter's upside-down face. His eyes flutter open. He's surprised to find himself alive. Consternation flashes through him as he discovers that he's tightly strapped in. He is now wearing a military flight suit. Captain Coulter Stevens, this is Beleaguered Castle. Acknowledge transmission. The measured calm of a mission controller's voice comes over Coulter's headset. Captain Stevens, do you copy? Where am I? You're with Beleaguered Castle. Pull back fractionally to reveal Coulter in a tight and confined capsule. It bristles with sophisticated electronics and ghostly glowing diodes. He's like an astronaut in an orbiter craft. Are you functional? He tries to clear his head. He's still upside down. I'm dizzy. Adjusting your rotation. Very slowly, almost imperceptibly, Coulter's upside-down face begins to turn and right itself. Can you report at this time? What is this? Who am I talking to? More confusion. No idea how to react. Just as on the train. Report what you saw. When? Just now. I was on a train. And? And there was a bomb. He's panicking. What the hell is going on? Just relax, Captain. Later, we're still in the tiny chamber. It's stabilized, as has Coulter, but in the manner of a dangerous wild animal given a sedative. Embedded into the controls is a two-inch square video monitor. It shows the face of Goodwin. He's a middle-aged communications officer. Although we know him as Goodwin, his military name badge and rank insignia have been covered up. He wears a headset and sits surrounded by banks of electronic equipment and keyboards. He peers in at Coulter, exuding the blandness of a military flight controller. Stand by for thread one of alpha memory pattern. Who are you? You already have that information, Captain. Now think. Recall my name. A long moment. A name floats into his head. Goodwin? Correct. How do I know that? I have no idea how I know your name's Goodwin. Commencing memory pattern. Listen to me. Something's wrong. I was flying a mission. I was in a chopper. And then I woke up on a train, and now I'm here. Can you explain that? What unit is this? You're with Beleaguered Castle. Who? You're with friends. Patiently. The exercises will assist you. Are you ready? Just like with the train, he seems to have no choice but to go along with it. Memory Thread 1 Listen to the following passage. When Lily woke, she had the bed to herself. She sat up, bewildered by the strangeness of her surroundings. Then, memory returned, and she looked about her with a shiver. In a cold slant of light, reflected from the back wall of a neighboring building, she saw her evening dress and opera cloak lying on a tawdry heap on a chair. End of thread one. Silence. Is it Coulter's turn to speak? I don't get it. Is this a red flag exercise? Thread two. Listen. I am holding the following hand of cards. Queen of spades. Four of clubs. 
nine of clubs, three of hearts, nine of hearts. I repeat, queen of spades, four of clubs, nine of clubs, three of hearts, nine of hearts, end of thread two. Beads of sweat on Coulter's forehead. What the hell? Thread three. The following is a recording of a western screech owl. A rather spooky bird call plays, a short whistle, followed by a long trill. The call is repeated twice more. End of thread three. End of pattern. Acknowledge. Unexpectedly, in the back of his mind, a reply is there. Acknowledge. End of pattern. How did he know to say that? A conditioned response? Stand by to initiate pattern recall. Go for pattern recall. The response comes to him more quickly, like lines from an old script, even if it still baffles him. The five playing cards. Arrange them in order of descending values, irrespective of suit. He thinks for a moment. Focus. Play along. Maybe it will be all okay. Queen, two nines, four, and a three. That is correct. The passage I read contained mention of a woman's name. What was that name? Lori. No, Lily. Her name was Lily. At each answer, Goodwin makes notations and adjusts gauges. That is correct. End of pattern. Goodwin leans forward to flip a switch and everything goes dark. Over darkness, the sound of background conversation... Engineers speaking in technical jargon. Click. The unit's video monitor comes on again, illuminating Coulter in its glow. He's still strapped into the capsule. The tiny monitor shows an out-of-focus view of a lab, like a movie camera inadvertently left on between takes. Engineers wander past, oblivious. Their disjointed conversations continue at low volume. Abruptly, a man smoking a pipe sits down in front of the camera. His graying hair is windblown and unkept. His eyes are piercing blue. He wears a track and field warm-up jacket. He looks in at us in an unsettling Cheshire Cat grin. He puffs on his pipe and winks. Pressing a button, click. The whole thing is off again. Sound and picture vanish, leaving us suspended. An indeterminate amount of time has passed, and Goodwin is back on the monitor. Please list the primary specifications of the aerial platform you've been trained to operate. Coulter mulls his options. Should he talk? Keep silent? He tugs against the steel harness holding him in. A hatch, like the kind used on submarines, seals the capsule. Goodwin's voice grows slightly louder over his headset. Please list the primary specifications of the aerial platform you've been trained to operate. Is someone going to tell me what's going on here? Please list the primary... The UH UH-60 Blackhawk helicopter weighs 20,250 pounds with a maximum exterior load capacity of 8,000 pounds. It has a range of 320 nautical miles and is armed with two 762mm machine guns. That is correct. He suddenly redirects. Who bombed the train? The train? Who bombed the train, Captain? I have no idea. Whom do you suspect bombed the train? I don't know. You didn't see? Well, could you tell me what the hell's going on here? The Screech Owl song can be seen as a progression of musical notes. Did the notes go up, down, or remain at the same pitch? I don't know. Just tell me... How many times was the bird call repeated? What does this have to do with the train? How many times was the bird call repeated? Twice! Incorrect. Who bombed the train, Captain? I don't know who bombed the train. Coulter is seething now. He's had it with these games. You have 17 minutes. Use them. Find the bomber. Goodwin leans forward to press a button and click. Everything goes dark. We hear Coulter's nervous breathing. Hey, what's happening? The hum of machinery starting up. God damn it, Goodwin! What is all this? The machinery hum changes modulation. 
then gives way to a gentle rocking sensation. The thunk, the thunk, the thunk. Coulter opens his eyes. Sunlight hits his face. In flickering patterns, he turns to look out a train window. At the passing woodland scenery, he's back on the train. Back in the same navy sports coat. Across from him, Christina is at work on her sketch pad, just like before. Other commuters all around him. Everything is exactly the same as before. The remainder of the story will follow this binary pattern. Scenes will take place either on the train or in the capsule. Compared to tomb-like isolation chamber he just came from, the train is exploding with sensory input. The smell of steaming coffee, the cramped proximity of other passengers, the crinkle of a freshly ironed dress shirt, the glint of a buckle on a purse, the slanting sunlight, the trees out the window bursting with summer leaves. Almost unintentionally, Coulter finds himself repeating the same opening actions as last time, checking his watch, 7.40 a.m., turning at the scent of passing coffee, peeking in the canvas messenger bag beside him. This time, however, he takes the book out of the messenger bag. The books are stamped New York Public Library. He also takes out the apple, sniffs it, and takes a bite. It's good. No, it's awesome. Crisp and delicious. Is Goodwin watching him from somewhere? Not knowing what else to do, he takes a few more bites, enjoying this small pleasure. He reaches in his sports jacket pocket and pulls out his train ticket. It hasn't been punched yet. Thuk-tsh. The overweight man opens his can of soda, just as before. It's a goddamn simulation! Christina's pen stops sketching. She glances up. A three-dimensional, completely immersive scenario. Touch, taste, sound, sight, and smell. A measure of relief. A way to think about all this. Are you talking to me? Complete with pretty girl. Pretty girl? Every combat simulator has one. In the middle of a firefight, a pop-up window starts playing a porno. Confident now. You're an unusual choice for a distraction. And you are a moron. Disregarding her, Coulter gets up, pursuing a new line of action. The only way he can make sense of this. He starts walking up the rows. Find the bomber. Find the bomber. The conductor approaches him. Ticket? Expecting this now, Coulter hands over his ticket to be punched. Everything okay, Chief? Say what? Anything out of the ordinary. The conductor frowns at him. Who is this guy? Please take a seat, sir. Coulter moves on. He looks for suspects. We've seen these faces before. The computer engineer, the secretary, the stockbroker, the backpacker, and so on. All seem normal. He finds himself focusing on a jumble of unfiltered details. Suits, ties, shoes, and skirts. Watches, newspapers, coffee cups, litter. Sudden dizziness. He grabs a seat back for support. Sensory details slam into him. We go extremely close on the stitching on a leather purse. A fountain pen rattling in a fold-out tray. Air conditioning hissing from a vent. A crumpling sound as the overweight man crushes the empty soda can. Tap, tap, tap. The computer engineer tapping his foot on the floor, faster and faster. Derek, the Wall Street type, talks on his phone. Trust me, by one o'clock, the bridge is going to be jammed. Then, the click of a lock unlatching. The restroom door swings open. Guzman, the Middle Eastern man, emerges. After a furtive glance around, he quickly takes a seat. Now Coulter makes the connection. The bomb in the restroom. The Middle Eastern man emerging from the same restroom. Coulter starts down the long aisle. In his seat, Guzman slips on dark glasses. 
He looks foreboding with his mustache and olive-covered skin. How's it going? Coulter stands in front of him, arms crossed. Behind his dark glasses, Guzman ignores him, but he's visibly uncomfortable. What's your name? Guzman is stock still, beads of sweat on his forehead. The conductor appears, accosting Coulter. Didn't I tell you to take a seat? Goodwin, where are you? It's over, I found him. Appealing to Goodwin's invisible presence, but nothing happens. Who are you talking to? An edgy silence, other passengers looking over. Coulter is about to retort, about to accuse Guzman, when he stops. It's too easy. Coulter senses the uproar he's about to create, which might be a mistake. He reconsiders. Sorry, this guy seemed a little anxious. I was worried about him. Guzman, in a thick accent. I am minding my business. Tell him to mind his. The conductor has noticed Guzman's white-knuckle uneasiness. You feeling all right, sir? With a pained smile, Guzman loosens his collar. Motion sickness, I'm afraid. I believe I will get off at the next stop. Very well. The conductor turns back to Coulter. Okay, I'm sitting down. Turning away, he finds a seat. He studies Guzman out of the corner of his eye. Now approaching Newark Station. Newark Station, next stop. The train begins to slow down. Several rows up, he sees Christina. She looks back at him with distaste. A small number of passengers get up, among them the college student. He catches Coulter's attention as he picks up a wallet from a seat and catches up with Derek, the stockbroker, who's about to get off the train. Hey, you dropped this! Derek, relieved, takes back the wallet. Wow, thanks! The college student waits to get off. Coulter now eyes him closely. As the train pulls to a stop, Guzman forcefully pushes forward toward the doors, moving with a barely contained urgency. Excuse me, please let me through! Coulter to himself. Jesus, he's running away! The doors slide open. Newark Station. The old man, Derek, and the college kid get off. Guzman hurries past them toward the station house. All aboard, doors are closing. Just before the doors close, Coulter steps out onto the platform. His eyes lock on Guzman, who disappears inside the station house. The train pulls off, leaving Coulter behind. Did he make the right move? As he goes to pursue Guzman, Coulter is struck by more sensory impressions. The station clock. Its digital numbers flash 7.50 a.m., hurting Coulter's eyes with their brightness. The dying hiss of the rails as the train recedes down the track. The super-sharp glint of a penny embedded down in the gravel of the tracks. A melancholy sigh of trees in the wind. Pushing it all aside, he hurries after Guzman. Coulter enters the Newark station house. There's no sign of Guzman, just an empty marble lobby. A lone clerk restocks timetable brochures at a display. A guy just came through here. Did you see where he went? The clerk not looking up. Lots of guys come through here. Windows look out over the station's parking lot. There's no sign of Guzman there. He was just here. A Middle Eastern looking guy. Through the platform doors come Derek, followed by the college kid. Derek heads for the parking lot, while the college kid mills around the newspaper stand. A muffled cough. Coulter spins and sees a door marked Men's Room. Pushing open the door, Coulter discovers a row of 1930s era sinks and stalls. An intercom crackles to life. The train to Philadelphia will be four minutes late. The train to Philadelphia will be four minutes late. Coulter's footsteps echo down the length of the deserted men's room. The last stall door is shut. From within the closed stall comes the sound of vomiting. Coulter edges closer. A toilet flushes. 
Guzman emerges from the stall and looks awful. He freezes when he sees Coulter. All better now? Guzman's face hardens. He goes to the sink to wash his hands. Don't care much for trains myself. The bathroom mirror, of course, reflects back Sean Fentress's face and not Coulter's. Guzman does not seem to notice this disparity. He picks up his briefcase and briskly walks out. Coulter takes an uneasy look at Fentress looking back at him in the mirror, then follows Guzman out. Coulter emerges in the lobby. Guzman is nearby, a bit indecisive. Coulter wanders over to the newspaper stand. The station clock reads 7.54 a.m. Coulter looks down at his watch, three minutes remaining. What will Guzman do? Guzman glances over at Coulter and then heads through the doors and back out onto the train platform. Guzman sits on a bench. Coulter stops nearby him. I resent this. This is harassment. You obviously work for someone. FBI? CIA? I expected this reception in your country. How are you going to pull this off? That bomb has a cell phone detonator. I don't see a payphone around here, so I'm betting you got a phone on you, with the number already programmed in. I have no idea what you're talking about. I'm an international businessman, an executive. The tracks begin to vibrate. In the distance comes the horn of an express train approaching. Open your briefcase. Prove to me there's no phone in there. Guzman. I will prove nothing to you. Leave me alone. Wham! Coulter punches Guzman with tremendous force, sending Guzman sprawling to the ground. Coulter's hand throbs from the force of the punch. The simulation's reality stuns Coulter all over again. Crunching down, Coulter pops open Guzman's briefcase. Inside is a corporate identification badge with Guzman's name and photograph on it. The company is Shell Oil. Hassan Guzman, Vice President Shell Oil. Must be a cover. Philadelphia train now approaching. Guzman groans in pain, and Coulter rifles through his briefcase. Where the hell's your phone? He looks at his watch again. Twenty seconds. Grabbing Guzman, Coulter goes through his suit pockets. He triumphantly pulls out Guzman's cell phone and steps back. Guzman looks up at him, eyes moist with humiliation and malice. I thought so. Now let's see you try to... A distant thud rattles the station windows. Coulter pivots and looks down the tracks. The first thing he sees is the express train closing in on the station. The second thing he sees far beyond it, miles further down the tracks, is the rising plume of a huge explosion. Coulter looks back at Guzman in shock, and then down at Guzman's cell phone, which has remained off. You didn't do it. Disbelief. As the din of the distant explosion is drowned out by the roar of the arriving express train, with a cry of rage, Guzman springs up and pushes Coulter into the path of the oncoming express train. With a blast of its horn, the train runs him over. Everything stops. Like film celluloid catching fire in a projector, the world itself blisters and burns into searing white, until smothering, forgetful silence. For exactly two-thirds of a second, one-third of a second longer than before, the same flickering after-image appears, thin lines radiating outward. This time, they all connect into the spokes of a wheel, a bicycle wheel. In the isolation unit, the sound of machinery straining. Coulter is slammed back into his seat, back in the capsule. All he can do is hang on and gasp for air. Holy fuck! Stabilize. Lower your pulse. Coulter opens his eyes. He's back in his military flight suit. The craft goes still. Cautiously, he releases his hands from their grip on the seat restraints. 
He looks like he's sweated off five pounds. Do you need to urinate? A fucking train just ran me over. Do you need to urinate? How are you doing this? Am I on some kind of drug? Did you find the bomber? I didn't find the bomber. You fooled me with the Middle Eastern guy. I went for the diversion. What kind of freaky simulation is this? Get me out of here. What Middle Eastern guy? Be specific. Guzman, Shell Oil. Look, I don't have intel experience. Why do you have me doing this? You've already been told what you need to know. Discipline your memory. Limit your operational awareness to the task we assign you. Everything else is irrelevant. Irrelevant? Killing me each time is irrelevant? You do not die. As you can see, you simply return to us. How? How can you do that? Silence. Who's the man with the pipe? Say again? There was a man smoking a pipe. I saw him on the monitor. Who is he? How does he fit into this? The man with the pipe isn't here right now. Let me talk to him. This isn't right. I'm not your prisoner. Goodwin makes technical adjustments to dials and gauges. You feel unsatisfied with our relationship? What is this? Why are you talking like that? Is this some kind of script? If Guzman, the Middle Eastern man, is innocent, as you maintain, who might be the guilty party? Who cares? I'm tired of this. This isn't a game, Captain. Then what is it? Don't you already know who the bomber is? Don't you have all the answers? We have no answers. Only corpses. A weird beat. Corpses? Whose corpses? The passengers? Some were too badly burned to be identified. The heat from the explosion fused many of them completely into the wreckage. Is this the truth or some evasive answer? His mind pulls in all kinds of unpleasant directions. These were real people? Yes. This really happened? Yes. When? Today. Today? The train blew up today? It was attacked this morning, 7.57 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, six miles outside of New York City. Coulter's head is spinning. You're lying. I don't believe it. What do your senses tell you? His senses tell him it's true, but how can he accept it? Where am I right now, as we speak? With beleaguered castle. My unit is still in Iraq. I fly missions in Iraq. I flew one yesterday. Your unit was rotated stateside three weeks ago. The news comes like a slap in the face. Coulter clearly has no memory of this. Then why do I still have Iraqi dirt underneath my fingernails? Goodwin simply makes another adjustment on the controls. Talk to me. Three weeks? I've been back three weeks? How did I get in here? Have I seen my family? Does my father know I'm home? Because I'd kind of like to tell him if that's the case. Listen up, soldier. Goodwin hunches forward, putting his elbows on the desk. As he does so, he inadvertently reveals a glimpse of his military unit shoulder patch. The insignia contains wings and a lightning bolt across a background of stars. Underneath is written C-A-O-C-N. The train is just the beginning. Our intel says there are many more attacks coming today, and they are linked with the train. Time is of the essence. Do you understand? Coulter barely hears. He's fixated on that shoulder patch. Captain? I'm listening. DNI counterterrorism has come up with five most likely follow-up targets in the New York area. They are, in no order of importance, the Holland Tunnel, Newark International Airport, the Brooklyn Bridge, Penn Station, and the Empire State Building. It could be any of them. It could be none of them. Whatever it is, 
If you find the bomber and learn his plan, the next one we might be in a position to prevent. Those are your orders. It's too much information to process. Coulter's head spins with questions. Wait, if I'm somehow on that train before it blows up, why don't I just dismantle the bomb? Those are not your orders. But all those people dying, those are not your orders. You are not to influence events any more than is needed to in order to accomplish your mission. Military priorities. Defying comprehension. I didn't volunteer for this shit. Would you like to see the release form you signed? How do I know it's real? How do I know you didn't force me to sign it? And how the hell can I be put on a train over and over again? A train I was never really on. Coulter might as well be talking to a wall. I don't believe in time travel, Goodwin. There's no such thing. Machinery begins to run, like the whine of a jet engine firing up. Only one way forward, Captain. Seventeen minutes. Find the truth. Why seventeen? Why me? Why, why any of this? The capsule begins to shake. Let me out! Don't send me there! The sound effects enter a huge roar into the train hurling down the tracks. Landscape flies by. Coulter's forehead rests against the glass window, piercing sunlight. Shit, this is not happening. He leans back in his seat, as if just another beaten down office worker on the train. Isn't life grand? Across from him, Christina sketching, a gentle smirk. He focuses in on her, not knowing where else to begin. You're an artist? I went to art school. Doesn't make me an artist. Can I see what you're working on? Her pencil pauses. She eyes Coulter. I'd rather not. He looks down at his watch. 7.41 a.m. He's been back for one minute. Adjusting the settings, he changes the digital display to count down the remaining 16 minutes. He tries again for human contact. You don't look like you belong here, the way you're dressed. You certainly do. I really like to see what you're working on. Unless you're worried I won't like it. It's private, and your opinion doesn't interest me. So you scribble away on that thing so as to not deal with people. She scowls, tosses the sketch pad onto his lap. Surprised, Coulter opens it. It's full of faces, thumbnail portraits of other passengers riding the train. They're exquisitely observed, darkly stylized into expressions of loneliness. They're amazing. I wouldn't go that far. Seriously, they're, they're really good, Miss... Christina... My name's Coulter. How many of these passengers have you drawn? All of them, practically. She leans forward, eyes glinting, conspiratorially. I know all about them. You know all about them? I'm a collector of moments. The woman over there? She's a patent attorney with three kids and a summer place on Long Island. More importantly, though, she colors her hair herself and she wears the same houndstooth check suit every third Wednesday. The nebbishy fellow behind her, he always calls into his office three minutes before we go into the tunnel. And the guy with the shaved head and leather jacket eating a scone has a profile identical to that of Julius Caesar. A click of the restroom door opening. Guzman emerges from the bathroom and returns to his seat. What about that guy? Christina looks over at Guzman. I haven't seen him before today. He's cranky. He thinks the worst of people. Dangerous? Everybody's dangerous. You see anything unusual happen this morning? Anything out of the ordinary? I'm not sure I know what you mean. Has anyone else come out of that bathroom that you remember? She takes a closer look at him. A puzzled smile. Who are you? Coulter hesitates, debating. 
Don't you know? Haven't you seen me here every day for, what, three months? Something's different about you today. If I told you that there's a terrorist on this train, that I was sent here to catch him, would you believe me? Most fervently. Then tell me which one you'd arrest. Christina pages through her sketch pad again, considering different faces. They're all so utterly normal. That's what's terrifying about them. Perhaps there's more than one. A team at work. The patent attorney in cahoots with Julius Caesar, the Nebishi guy. Don't forget the sullen college kid. He's the expendable one. But they're all controlled by this good-looking stockbroker. She shows him her sketch of Derek the stockbroker. Blonde, blue-eyed, hyper-alert, the perfect Machiavellian operative. Out for himself, he'll betray them all in the end. She's not taking him seriously. Never mind. He gets up, foolish of him to confide in her. His watch now reads 13 minutes. Now approaching Newark Station. Newark Station, next stop. The train begins to slow. Derek, Guzman, the old man, and the college kid head toward the exit doors. He's getting away! Coulter moves aside to let them walk past. Thanks for your help, ma'am. Curt dismissal. Ma'am? How old do you think I am? I don't know, 32? Her icy glare tells him he's guessed too high. The disembarking passengers exit the platform. The train is moving again. In the exit area, Coulter watches the station disappear. He's doing this all wrong. Next stop, New York Penn Station. Two screws rattle in the sink. Coulter gazes up at the half-open ventilation shaft, at the edge of the sinister bomb planted there. Back down to the mirror, Sean Fentress's face. The most baffling mystery of all. What happened, Fentress? Who are you? How can I be you? A flash cut back in the isolation unit. On the monitor, the glimpse of Goodwin's shoulder patch insignia. The unit initials C-A-O-C-N. Back to the scene. Coulter churning over the thought. C-A-O-C-N. What unit is that? A knock on the door. Through the windows comes the blur of the express train whizzing past the same train which previously ran over Coulter. Emerging from the bathroom, Coulter discovers Christina there. Who are you talking to? Leave me alone. Coulter walks off. Irked at his change in tone, she follows him, carrying his messenger bag. My pleasure, okay? It's just you left your bag on your seat? Trying to be cute. It's a flagrant violation of rail security, leaving a suspicious package behind and all that. Maybe you're the terrorist. This is too much. Coulter turns on her, paranoid. Terrorist? Why did you say that? I was joking. Stop joking. Who are you? Are you an operative? I had no idea you were so thoroughly weird. I'm not entirely sure I like it. Why do you have sketches of everybody on board? Are you part of this? Part of what? I can have you arrested. Maybe that's the only way you'll drop the bullshit and talk. Stay put, I'm getting help. She sees he's serious and drops her arch playfulness. Speaks in a flat, sober voice. Who am I? I'll tell you. I'm 27 years old. I have no savings and no health insurance. He turns back. Wait. The more she speaks, the angrier she gets. Six months ago, I moved back in with my parents because I ran out of money. I got A's in line drawing and advanced oil painting, but no one is buying my stuff. Two weeks ago, I put away all my paints. My little sketchbook is the last thing left. You see, I'm not an artist. I'm a receptionist in a law firm. The only thing I operate is a phone switchboard. The stark reality of her life. The horn of the freight train yanks his attention to the window. Up ahead are the row houses, 
opposite which the train exploded. Time is running down. Now let me tell you about you. You work at the New York Public Library. You've been eyeing me for months on this train, but you haven't said a word to me. You're bland and colorless and predictable. And now I see you're delusional, too. Coulter doesn't hear her. He's still looking out the window. Above the row houses, a commercial airliner is climbing serenely into the blue after takeoff out the Newark airport. The view is wiped away as the freight train comes surging past the windows, but the sight of the plane has already caused something to click in Coulter's head. Son of a bitch! C-A-O-C-N! That's not the Army, that's the Air Force! Combined Air and Space Operations Center! Nellis Air Force Base! Are you mocking me? They're running this whole thing out of Nellis' Air Force Base in Nevada. Fucking Nevada. Tears in Christina's eyes. That Coulter would persist in this delusion after what she's confessed about herself. Coulter racks his brain. What's there? What's on that base? B-52s, KC tankers, Air Combat Command, Predator drones, remote operations. There's something to this. This is a remote operation. What if it is time travel? A worried conductor runs past them, talking rapidly into his radio. We catch the words, bomb threat. What did he say? A warning alarm begins beeping. Passengers look around uneasily. Christina, however, focuses her anger on Coulter. Do me a favor. Don't ever talk to me again. She drops his messenger bag at his feet and walks away. Coulter looks down at his watch. The last seconds tick away. Five, four, three. Christina! He grabs her and she struggles against him. Get off me! But he holds her tight, shielding her with his body and squeezing his eyes shut as the explosion rips through the train and everything vaporizes. Blinding light, painful to look at, like a star exploding. A dull, hollow sound of wind rattling through an abyss. Then, the ghostly still life. Details flicker into view. A bicycle, a stone wall, and next to it, a woman. It's Christina, turning to look at us. A gentle, reassuring smile. Click, click. The video monitor in the isolation unit is malfunctioning. It flickers on and off, revealing Coulter's face in and out of darkness. The capsule is nearly shut down. The controls appear non-functional. Ice crystals have formed over the circuitry. Coulter hugs himself, shivering. His breath is visible in the capsule's tomb-like cold. Goodwin, what's happening? Come in, can you read me? It's goddamn cold in here. He hits a few buttons, almost at random. The vents, which have been blowing in air, fall silent. Goodwin, I'm losing oxygen. The monitor fizzles out. The light from the control fades. Goodwin! It's now completely dark. He bangs on the side of the capsule, just a muffled thump. A terrifying silence. The snap of a harness releasing. A thud as Coulter falls to the floor of the capsule, cursing. Some sounds of thrashing around, and then a spark of a blue flare illuminates Coulter's face. He has activated a miniature signal light on his flight suit. It begins to blink, like a beacon for downed pilots afloat in the sea. It's the only light in an otherwise dead capsule. Up on his knees, he grasps the release handles of the exit hatch. Using all his strength, he turns, but the handles don't budge. The hatch remains sealed. He gets to his feet and can't stand up fully. The capsule is incredibly cramped. Rifling through a cabinet, he discovers operational manuals in small, almost illegible type and a small set of tools. He spreads them out on a tiny ledge. 
taking a wrench, he bangs on the escape hatch, a deep, clanging echo in the hull. So, like any pilot would, he sets about repairing his craft. At first, he puzzles over the electronics and circuitry, daunted by the complexity. There's no time to lose. Using a miniature screwdriver, he begins unscrewing the monitor panel. His fingers are slow and clumsy in the frigid cold, and the screwdriver slips out of his hands. Later, icicles have appeared over dormant air vents. Coulter, ice crystals in his hair, is shivering more violently. Much of the capsule's electronics lay open and exposed. Using copper wires, He's attempting to revive a row of batteries. They spark once, twice, nothing. Another spark, it shocks him. There's a puff of blue smoke. He's burned his fingers. Now the battery has a tiny blinking green light. Working fast, Coulter attaches the copper wires to the leads on the battery. From inside the engine comes a faint electric hum. The monitor awakens. Like a film projector, it throws the image of a playing card onto the opposite side of the craft. Coulter begins replacing the monitor components. As he does, a pre-recorded audio file comes in. Four principal dialects of Arabic. Egyptian, Gulf, Syrian, Lebanese, and North African. We will now play you portions of each, discussing the audible differences between them. Clips of Arabic begin to play. Coulter continues reconstituting the computer. The monitor fills with scrolling lines of computer code. With an oddly low-tech clang, the heart of the machine reawakens. The air vents come back to life. Heat starts to return. The icicles begin to drip. Coulter sits back in his seat, exhausted from the work. The monitor switches to a real-time view of the lab. Goodwin's chair is there, but Goodwin is not in sight. In a background distorted by the fisheye lens, various technicians wander by. Hello? Anyone out there? It's me. He toggles an audio jack. Then, a man comes walking up, frowns into the camera, as if through the foggy lens of another world. It's the man with the pipe, the elusive bohemian scientist whom... Coulter glimpsed once before. He'll be known as Rutledge. Can you hear me? Rutledge is tinkering with the camera. The image shakes for a moment as he adjusts it. Then he puts on a headset. Project designer initiating sequence and drives check. I'm here, okay? Rutledge checks his headset. Not sure he heard right. Is someone there? Yeah, it's me, Coulter. Rutledge blinks in surprise, the blue eyes sparkling. Wow, it's you! The capsule lost power. It's still pretty cold in here. We've been working toward you from the other side. Nice to have you with us again. You feeling all right? I think so. Who are you? The name's Rutledge. They wouldn't let me talk to you before. No, I guess not. They're pretty anal around here. He lights his pipe. Don't tell them you saw me smoking in here, okay? His genial eccentricity is completely at odds with the military environment. Then it occurs to Coulter. You're the inventor of this thing. I prefer the term project designer. He shrugs. And sorry for all the secrecy. Goodwin will be thrilled, you re-established contact. I don't want to deal with Goodwin anymore. What? Don't you understand? He's torturing me. I'm helpless. Can't you get me out of here? Rutledge looks uneasy. As a scientist, he's ill-equipped to deal with personnel issues. Why would Goodwin have it in for you? He's a remote operator, and remote operators are risk-averse pussies who sit at control screens in the rear 
while actual pilots like me put their asses on the line in the field. He seems pretty devoted to the mission. And just what mission is this? Talk to me, man. Why don't you let me save those people on the train? Because they can't be saved. Why? I know what's going to happen. I could take apart the bomb and stop the train. Yeah, but you'd be doing it in the source code, not here. Not in our own past. Mystery upon mystery. What's the difference? I'm not sure I should be telling you this. Telling me what? Coaxing the scientist in him. It's quantum physics, linear algebra, parabolic calculus. It would take weeks to explain. Is source code time travel? Rutledge sighs and looks at his pipe. It's gone out again. Why can't I save those people on the train? Think of it like this. Events in our past can never be undone. Einstein proved that. So... So the source code opens up another past for you. A parallel past. It looks the same, but it has no intersection with our own world. In essence, by sending you back, an entirely new but utterly parallel world is created. It looks identical to ours, but nothing you do there has any effect on this reality. At last, some useful information. Coulter races to process it. What happens to the source code world after I leave it? I don't know. You can never know that because you're not there to observe it. Maybe it vanishes. Maybe not. Rutledge is uneasy. I should tell them you're okay. What about the bicycle? What bicycle? I see it each time, right after the bomb goes off, like an afterimage. There's a bicycle and a stone wall and a girl. It's a girl from the train. I don't know where any of this is supposed to be. Rutledge removes the pipe from his mouth. Wait, you see all this after you leave the train? Yeah, just for a split second. Rutledge is stunned, like he's discovered some strange new property to his invention. Please tell me you're not making this up. No, it's there. What do you think it means? I don't know. Rutledge looks off camera for a moment. They're here. No more time to talk. Make sure he sends you back in. Find out more about the after images. Goodwin appears, and Rutledge reluctantly takes off his headset. Rutledge, wait! Don't leave me! Rutledge steps away. A pointed look at Coulter. Goodwin settles back into his seat, donning the headset. Welcome back. How are you feeling? I'm alive, no thanks to you. You find the bomber? You're a brick wall, Goodwin. A fucking brick wall. Lower your pulse. The situation has worsened. The fire on the tracks caused one of the freight cars to blow up and release some kind of gas. As a precaution, they're having to evacuate all of Lower Manhattan. Evacuate Lower Manhattan? The enormity of this. Having to take it on faith. We may have lost the initiative. What do you mean? Let's keep going. We were expecting more from you. I can give you more. Let me think for a second. But Goodwin ignores him, absorbed in paperwork. The freight car blows up from the fire. It spews gas, or what could be gas. It might be chlorine, so they can't take any chances. Anxious now trying to make up lost ground, whatever it takes to get sent back in. So they decided to play it safe and evacuate parts of New York City. Maybe that's part of the terrorists' plan, right? So who benefits from that? What's vulnerable? What's down there in Lower Manhattan? Wall Street. He surprises himself with this insight. Now Goodwin is paying attention 
waiting for more. Wall Street, that's what they're going to hit next, the financial markets. Goodwin considers this. For the first time, slightly impressed. I want to show you something. We cut to driver's license photos. The video monitor shows Christina's DMV shot, her wry, secretive smile. Did she die, too? Yes. This driver's license photo was found with her body. We're creating a database of recovered identification as they come in from the site. A pang of sorrow. Moving among ghosts. You sure she's dead? Would you like to see her morgue photos? Coulter quietly. She was sitting across from me. We know. The video monitor plays a grainy handheld video of the train wreckage. Rescue workers in protective gear picking their way carefully through the twisted charred remains of the two trains. This was taken shortly after the rescue crews arrived on the scene. The time code on the image reads 8.26 a.m. We noted the location of each corpse when we pulled it out. On screen, rescue workers pull a charred corpse out of the wreckage. Prepare yourself. This is unedited footage. I told you I didn't want to see her! The camera zooms in on a corpse. Its burned face, like a piece of rotten fruit, fills the screen. Nevertheless, we recognize it. And it's not Christina. It's someone else. That's... Sean Fentress. The man in the mirror. Himself, at least on the train. He died on the train? As a host identity, Sean Fentress had to have certain basic similarities to you. Gender, blood type, approximate age. His head was still intact. We need the head, you see, to link the two of you remotely. They carry the corpse toward a morgue truck with a vast array of satellite communication equipment attached to it. The image freezes and then dissolves back to Christina's DMV photo. Silence and pondering. Would you like to see the other passenger photos? Perhaps that would help you. You still have Christina's body? The other things she was carrying? Why? I want to know about her. Everything I can. She's not just another victim. She's connected to all this. In the train, the rich smell of steaming coffee. The glint of a polished leather shoe. The crisp click of someone uncapping a fountain pen. The scenery rushing by, the blur of trees, the soft lavender of the morning sky, the swell and pull of the mighty machine coursing over the rails. If a train ride could ever be a sensory delight, this is it. To Coulter, every sensation has become ever more pronounced, more intensely real than ever. We go close on his watch. A beep as he sets it to count down again from 17 minutes, the duration of his freedom. Across from him is Christina, absorbed with her sketching. $36.11. She looks up at him. In your wallet, right now. $36.11. Is this a magic trick or something? Yes. In five seconds, a guy's going to open a can of soda. Four, three, two, one. Th-ch. The overweight man opens his soda can. She gives Coulter a quizzical look. He points out the window. They're passing a neighborhood of modest homes. We're about to pass a street with willow trees. Two girls will be jumping rope. A white dog is going to run out behind them. A Dalmatian mix. In a moment, they pass a scene exactly as Coulter described. Christina's befuddled smile. You want to tell me how you're doing this? Close observation. You could say I'm a collector of moments. Collector of moments? Yes. That's the cheesiest line I've ever heard. She resumes her drawing. You trained to be an artist. No response. 
You got A's in line drawing and oil painting, but your work didn't sell. You took a job answering phones in a law firm. Six months ago, you moved back in with your parents. Two weeks ago, you put your paints away for good. The sketchbook is all you have left. Who the hell are you? Who have you been talking to? You. Me? No, I haven't ever talked to you. But we have, Christina. You've drawn all these people here. You know their routines. At one point, you thought you were different from all of them. But now, you're not so sure. Christina has gone white. Utterly incredulous. A small bar area. Coffee sloshing in styrofoam cups. Coulter hands one to Christina and sits down opposite her. A glance at his watch shows 12 minutes left. Okay, you've got my attention. Now tell me what this is all about. I need your help. Are you selling something? Listen to me. I can't use up any more time trying to convince you. I just need you to believe everything I'm about to tell you. This better be good. Bear with me. A beat. Where to begin? Your sketchbook. Is there a drawing of me in there? I'm not sure. Please, Christina. Yes, fine, here. She flips through it and shows him a sketch of Sean Fentress. I did it last week. The thing is, that's not me. Give me a little credit. No, you drew what you saw. But the person you're seeing now is someone else. I'm not Sean Fentress. I'm not even really on this train. Incomprehension. You're not really on this train? I'm taking someone's place. I'm borrowing it. My name is Coulter. I'm a soldier. I'm being held prisoner, and this is the only way, the only time and place I have to figure out how to escape. She gives him a blank look. After three months of riding the train, this is how you introduce yourself to me? I'm serious. Elements in the American military are using me for an experiment. I'm not sure exactly how it all happened, but I'm at a facility in Nellis Air Force Base in Nevada, right now as we speak. It's a project called Source Code. Source Code? It's a program. It shifts identities. It also performs small amounts of time travel. Or time engineering. I don't know the jargon. He's not getting through to her. It's too bizarre. I've been put on this train to look for someone, a criminal. I need to find out just enough about him to keep him putting me back on the train. Because right here is the only place I can figure out what's really happening. But I have very little time. And each time I come back, you won't remember me. And I'll have to go through all of this over again. You are, I think, deliciously mad. And how do I know all these things about you if we've never spoken before? She doesn't have an answer. Can't easily dismiss him. Why tell all this to me? There's lots of people around for you to talk to. Because I think you have the answer to this whole thing. Believe me, I don't have the answer for anything. There's a vision. I keep having it. It's very powerful, and you're in it, and there's a bicycle, and... This old stone wall, and it's very peaceful. Does this sound familiar? Like where you live, maybe? Stone walls? My parents live in a house with aluminum siding and an American eagle over the door. The only bike is a Harley, which the guy down the street revs at three in the morning. The vision must mean something. It's the only time when I'm not on the train or in the capsule. Why else would Rutledge be so interested? Who's Rutledge? Someone who's trying to help me understand something. Until they got to him. He lowers his head. A dead end. No answer. The train begins to slow down. Now approaching Newark Station. Newark Station, next stop. Coulter looks at his watch. Ten minutes left. I saw a program on TV. It was about psychics. They say psychics have a lot of paranoia. I don't believe in that shit. Through the window, the old man, Derek, and the college kid disembark. Guzman hurries past them to the station house. All aboard! Doors are closing! Don't you have people you can go to for help? Friends? Family? 
the train begins to move again. This is a New York-bound train. Next stop, New York Penn Station. Most of my friends are in the military. My dad runs a melon farm in Alabama. Maybe now's the time to reach out to him. She hands him her cell phone. Coulter just holds it in his hand. Me and my dad, we don't see eye to eye. We're just two different people. As opposed to being the exact same person? Are you always this sarcastic? This is so not about me. Coulter reluctantly dials. As it rings, what day is it? June 11th. June? One more thing to puzzle him. The call connects. An older man, Donald Stevens, answers. The gravelly voice of a Midwestern farmer. Hello? Dad? Donald doesn't respond. Dad, it's me. It's Coulter. Again, silence. Been a while, huh? I've been meaning to call you, but... Click. The line goes dead. Coulter looks at Christina. He wanted me to stay on and take over the farm, but... I had other ideas. You're intimidated by him. What? You're scared of him. I can see it. The hell I am. Challenged, he redials. Braced for conflict. The call connects. Dad, don't hang up. We're going to talk. I need your help. Now listen to me. Whoever you are, don't call here again. Donald hangs up. He's still mad at you, huh? No. It was like he didn't even know who I was. Troubled, he hands back her phone. Outside, the express train flashes by. I don't know how to help you. She feels bad for him. Something inside Coulter closes, retreating inside of himself. Sorry to have bothered you. He gets up to go, and Christina stays where she is. Back in his seat, lost in the view out the window, the neighborhood has given way to Newark's industrial fringe, bringing him closer to the inevitable end. I have a friend. Surprised, he turns to find her there. She works at the New York Times. Her name is Stephanie. She's just a proofreader, but... She wants to be a reporter. She's always saying she needs a good story to bring in so she gets noticed. Something like this with a crazy paranoid angle could really interest her. Forget it. She could do some poking around. She's already quite suspicious of the government. Christina is dialing her phone. Coulter turns back to the window. I'm getting voicemail. Into the phone. Steph, it's Christina. You know that story you're always looking to write? I might have found something for you. I met a guy. His name is Coulter Stevens. He says he's in the army. He flies helicopters in Iraq. And now they've put him into a secret project called Source Code. Maybe you can look into it a bit? Okay, call me. She hangs up, pleased with herself. She'll call back. Just wait. None of it will do Coulter any good. But he manages a smile. Thank you, ma'am. Ma'am? How old do you think I am? He gives her a wary look and considers. Twenty-five? She smiles, pleased. No, but thanks. What do you mean there's a criminal on the train? How do you know that? Coulter looks away, careful. I just do. How can I help you if you don't tell me everything about this? Coulter enters the tiny bathroom. Christina is reluctant to follow him into the bathroom. You said you wanted to know. Can't you just tell me? He gives her an imploring look. She sighs and squeezes in next to him. Try anything and I'll kill you. Shut the door. As she shuts the door, Coulter gets up on the sink. What are you doing? He wrenches back the ventilation panel and then steps aside. It's up here. He holds out his hand. She grabs hold and steps up on the sink. She's not quite tall enough to see into the crawl space, so he steps up behind her and lifts her the rest of the way. Startled, feels his hands. What are you... Just look. Her blouse brushes his face as he holds her up. 
a long beat as she looks inside the overhead space at the bomb. Is that? Acetone peroxide. It's a liquid explosive. There's 14 canisters of it. Simple detonator. Cell phone signal closes the circuit, and, uh, boom. He lowers her. An incredulous beat. Did you put this there? No, it was someone else. They don't know who. That's why I'm here, to find out. Watching her. Will she believe him? We have to tell someone. We have to stop this. The bathroom door of the train opens, and Christina walks quickly away. Mounting fear. Coulter falls into step behind her. It won't matter. The train is already... Already what? I've been sent here. It sounds crazy, but it's true. I've been sent from the future. From five hours in the future. This train has already been blown up. She backs up, scared of him. Every right to be. You wanted to know. Now you know. She turns and hurries for the exit doors. This isn't happening. I've got to get off. Coulter catches up with her inside the exit vestibule. She's stabbing at the door release button. Why won't it open? Her phone is ringing. They both stop. She looks at the number. It's Steph. I told you she'd be interested. Hi. Her eyes are fixed suspiciously on Coulter as she listens. Coulter looks outside. He recognizes the terrain and looks down at his watch. Fifty seconds. It's awful. Unbearable. He dashes toward the bathroom. He tears open the door and jumps up on the sink. The bomb sits in the semi-darkness, faintly illuminated by the bathroom's fluorescent light. As he grabs hold of the bomb, he hears, Coulter? Working fast, he unhooks the leads on the detonator and rips away gaffing tape, jostling the canisters of explosives. Coulter, I have to tell you something. He pulls off the detonator cell phone. Ducking back down, he sees Christina standing in the doorway. Look, now the fucking thing can't go off. His watch reads 20 seconds. Stephanie did a computer search. Something in her expression worries him. She's got a database of all the newspaper articles going back to forever. Source code is classified. It won't be in the newspaper. No, but you were. She found you. She found me. What does that mean? She stops, not wanting to go on. From outside comes the horn of the approaching freight train. Jesus Christ, Christina, are you going to spit it out? In his hand, the cell phone rings. Coulter's eyes light up in amazement. The display screen is showing the name and number of the bomber. But before he can read what's there, Christina's voice finds its way into the back of his brain. According to the notice... You were killed in action two months ago. The world stops. A searing pain slams into him. He drops the phone and doubles over. She runs to him. Everything around him pixelates into a hundred thousand points on an array. Christina's cries become bursts of static. Flying behind the array come lines of computer code. The source code architecture laid bare. Then, the screen itself seems to melt, giving away to a frightening series of hallucinatory fragments. A pilot's point of view, desert sand, searingly bright, flight deck instrumentation, a windshield pockmarked with bullet holes, the horizon tilting as the helicopter plunges toward Earth amid a chaos of radio transmissions. Taking a lot of RPG fire. Be advised, A61 is going down. A61 is going down hard. Black smoke. Boots crunching on sand. As we are born. Point of view. A victim on a jostling stretcher. In a medevac helicopter, airborne again. The thud of rotors. Through blurred vision, we see medics working furiously to save a life. The smooth, glassy calm of 30,000 feet on a C-5 transport jet. The regular pulsations of a ventilator. Fluids drip down through an IV bag. Tubes and monitors stacked all around us. 
gurneys of other wounded packed together, the grumble of another unseen wounded soldier. Never any damn legroom on a plane. An alarm begins to beep. Hey, this guy's crashing. Silence and darkness, nothingness. Then, a playing card appears, as if through a slide projector. The jack of clubs. Captain? The playing card flickers, separated into pixels, and then dissolves. Captain, allow me to introduce myself. My name is Goodwin. You're with Beleaguered Castle. You are safe. All of your needs will be met here. Lines of computer code flit across the screen. A blinking cursor. A tiny aperture opens, revealing Christina and the bicycle, the stone wall, the strange recurring vision. Captain. The sound drives away the image, replacing it with the jack of clubs. Captain, just tell me what you see. Just look and speak. Groggy breathing, a ragged voice. I see a card. Very good, very, very good. On Coulter's face, a deep, cold knot in his stomach. Shuddering in fear, the truth before him now. Crouching there, a nightmare ruling over him. On the monitor, Goodwin looks into the camera, assessing the situation. Are you comfortable? Are you warm? Coulter clings to his harness as if to keep from vanishing entirely from existence. Do you need to urinate? Coulter swallows, too terrorized to speak. Beleaguered Castle is waiting for your report. Goodwin taps his pen on his clipboard, impatient. He flips a switch. A blocky computer voice, something out of the 1970s, comes on. Hearing test. First sequence. Left ear. A short series of electronic tones. Hearing test. First sequence. Right ear. The tones cease. Coulter remains impassive and inert. Captain, I know you can hear me. Did you find the bomber? Goodwin keys in some commands, forever adjusting. Memory thread one. When Lily woke, she had the bed to herself. She sat up, bewildered by the strangeness of her surroundings. Then memory returned, and she looked about with a shiver. Goodwin stops the audio. As you're collecting your thoughts, I should tell you there's been another development. A terrorist group has taken responsibility for bombing the train. This began broadcasting over the internet a half hour ago. We've traced it to Central Asia. On the monitor, a grainy video shows an arid, windswept plateau of a faraway desert. It is twilight. A Mujahideen fighter his face hidden by a hooded cloak, sits cross-legged before a flickering campfire and a tea service. The fighter arises, picking up a rocket-propelled grenade launcher and approaching the camera. The wind whips his black robes. The figure looks slight, almost spectral. It begins speaking to the camera. On the camera, in accented English. By now you have suffered the taste of divine vengeance. God willing, you will soon suffer another. Coulter does not raise his head. No idea whether he's even listening. The attacks will show you that you will never be safe. You can secure your borders. But what can you do against one of your own citizens? One who looks like you, who is blameless, living already among you, who takes 80 million of your dollars. A trifle and carries out our bidding. You cannot stop this. Time has run out. The image freezes and then switches back to the live feed of Goodwin. Let me talk to Rutledge. So you've decided to speak. Rutledge, get him. We appreciate your desire for further discussion. Perhaps at a later date. Will you let me out of here? Goodwin ignores the question, continues making notations. Frankly, Captain, 
We're disappointed. Find Rutledge now. I have to say that we expected more from you. Stop. Stop reading from your goddamn script. Perhaps we overestimated your abilities. I swear to fucking Christ. Please accept the criticism in the spirit it was given. Perhaps a few memory exercises would help. I don't need your criticism, and I don't need your memory exercises, you gutless freak. And by the way, that bomb is detonated by a cell phone. When activated, the phone's display screen displays caller ID information. Caller ID. I wonder if that information would be useful to beleaguered Castle. For a split second, Goodwin looks thrown, but the mask of the cold clinician goes back up. Very well. We're ready for that information. You'll have to send me back. I didn't get a look at it this time, but I will next time. Goodwin hesitates, skeptical. What assurances do we have you'll be able to read the screen before the device detonates? Goodwin, there's no time left. Send me back. Goodwin's pale, inscrutable face fills the monitor. His eyes are unblinking, unfeeling, nothing behind them. Coulter prowls the aisle feverishly. He scans the overhead luggage rack and peeks inside a bag. He doesn't see what he wants. He looks all around, up the rows of passengers, intently scanning. There, the computer engineer. He's asleep, but clutched in his hand is what Coulter wants, a cell phone. The train jolts slightly, waking him up. Looking down, the computer engineer notices that his cell phone has vanished. Across the aisle, a Latina office manager taps him on the arm. She gestures down the aisle to Coulter, who's walking away with the guy's cell phone. Behind him, the computer engineer gets up. Hey, do you have my phone? People turn to look. Among them is Christina. Coulter just starts walking faster. He's upset. Dude, give me back my phone! The computer engineer hurries in the second car. Coulter is nowhere in sight. He runs down the aisle and toward the next car. Pan over to the door of the conductor's compartment as it clicks shut. Breathless, Coulter has just finished shutting the door and is about to use the cell phone when he sees the conductor and a train official look over at him in surprise. Sorry. Wrong turn. Reversing gears, Coulter backs out of the compartment. Just as the befuddled computer engineer disappears into the third car, Coulter steps into the aisle and walks the other way. Sweating a bit now, Coulter is keying in a number on the cell phone as he walks. Operator, city enlisting. Las Vegas, Nevada, Nellis Air Force Base. Connecting you. A tingle up his spine. The call connects. Post operator. Is this Nellis Air Force Base? Yes, sir. How may I direct your call? He takes a deep breath. I'm trying to reach Captain Coulter Stevens. Calling himself? Strange. No idea where this is going. I have no listing for a Captain Coulter Stevens. Then give me the Combined Air and Space Ops Center. One moment, sir. The call seems to take forever to connect. Then, a terse military voice comes on the phone. C-Deck. Who is this? C-Deck. I'm calling for Rutledge. It's urgent. You have the wrong number. This is Captain Coulter Stevens. An eerie pause. Would you repeat that? Coulter Stevens. Captain Coulter Stevens. Hold the line. Now approaching Newark Station. Newark Station, next stop. The train slows as it pulls into Newark Station. Another voice comes on the phone. Captain, this is Goodwin. Coulter's heart sinks. Where are you, Captain? Let me talk to Rutledge. Where are you? How did you find us? I'm on the train. The train pulls to a stop. Newark Station. What train? Coulter realizes. You don't know. 
It hasn't happened yet. What hasn't happened? The explosion. What explosion? All aboard. Doors are closing. Don't you understand? I'm in it, Goodwin. I'm calling you from inside the mission. Inside the source code. A beat of stunned silence, and the train begins moving. Next stop, New York Penn Station. This contact is ill-advised. I must ask you to hang up. Goodwin, I'm trapped in this and I can't get out. You have no authorization to be making this call. Goodbye. No, wait, don't hang up. Forget authorization, there's no time. Soon, you're going to find out what happened on this train, and then your own day is going to start. But not until then. Right now, it's just you and me talking, and you're a different Goodwin than the one I'm going to go back to in a few minutes. You're separate from him. Separate worlds. Do you understand? I think so. Good. Now, there's a lot of secrecy in all this, and you have your reasons for that. But here and now, just this once, I need to ask you something, and I need you to tell me the truth. I'd rather you not ask me anything, Captain. I'm going to ask it. I should terminate this call. Jesus, Goodwin, how can I get through to you? You're not just a soldier. Somewhere inside, you're a human being, too. Somewhere inside, you've got to know that this is wrong. Source code is wrong. And if you can't grasp that, if you just follow orders, then you're just as much a prisoner as I am. The car shudders as the express train flashes by. Quiet returns as it recedes. What's your question? Surprised, Coulter raises his head and draws a breath. Did I survive that helicopter crash in Iraq? Silence. Coulter shuts his eyes. Answer me. Did I survive that crash? Another pause. This is crushing Coulter. Good win. Not physically. What? You did not physically survive the crash. A terrible chill comes over Coulter. He swallows, trying to stay brave. Not physically. Fuck! At least give me an answer I can understand. We've kept alive certain areas of your brain. But the capsule I'm in. A manifestation. Your way of making sense of it. This is crushing. Coulter fights back terror. You had no right. As a soldier... I was a soldier, then, but now, after death, it was the only way. You couldn't have a body and be sent back into the source code. What's the status of your mission? Is it a success? You really want to know? I suppose not. You're right to keep it from me. That's what we do, keep stuff from each other. Will this ever end? End? How can I get out of this? You must realize the army has made an investment in you. You'll be used again. How? Imagine a turntable with a record spinning on it. All we need to do is lift up the needle, and the music stops. And then what? Then we wait, until another mission. The needle comes down again. You won't remember any of this. We'll start with the playing cards. Electric tones, simple memory exercises bit by bit, will revive your cerebral capacities once more. The barbarism of it. Digital slavery. How many times have I done this? Does it matter? No one knows I'm here. No one can help me. In simulating your cortex, they're prolonging your life. Many soldiers would find that preferable to death. I can't do this. I served my country. I already gave my life. The courts. What? The courts know you're here. Military courts or civilian courts? Military. Coulter finds no comfort in this. I'm sorry you found out about all this. That wasn't our intention. Does that make it any less wrong? No answer. Coulter looks down at his watch. Time is running out. There's absolutely nothing he can do. Coulter's face is ashen, almost lifeless. 
Around him is the darkened steel cocoon of the isolation unit. Its appearance has altered slightly, given Coulter's new awareness of what this really is. The capsule is even more claustrophobic. There are fewer controls, and even less light. A shadow world. The monitor is blank. He shouts from the void. Goodwin! Rutledge appears, drops into the seat, and puts on the headset. He fiddles with his pipe as a way to avoid looking in the camera. How's it going? Any breakthroughs? I finally get it, Rutledge. You're the good guy, and Goodwin's the bad guy. Working together, you get what you want out of me. Why didn't I see it before? Believe me, Captain, I'm on your side. Drop it, I know about the helicopter crash. I know what they've done with me. Look, it's been a long day for all of us, but now... We've got to bring this home and catch a killer. What's in it for me? Come on, these guys are serious. Help me out, my ass is on the line too, you know. You can do better than that. They sent you here to offer me a deal. If you think I'm enjoying this, you're wrong. What's their offer? What can they possibly threaten me with after so colossally fucking me? Spit it out, you spineless turd. Rutledge's face goes red. Quite possibly no one has ever spoken to him like this before. After a sputtering pause, Rutledge's mouth hardens. The government can decide to take an interest in people. People like your father with his struggling farm. It can discover things like unpaid property taxes. It can call in his equipment loans or tie him down for years in environmental litigation. On the other hand... It can pay him handsomely for mineral deposits he never knew were there. As distant and problematic as your relationship was, surely you'd like the chance to do something for him. A beat of silent outrage from Coulter. Those after-images I saw, you never knew about them. They weren't part of the source code architecture, were they? They're meaningless. Nerves, firing, brain chemistry... You don't believe that. I've been to places you haven't. I crossed and recrossed that line between living and dying, and when I do, that veil gets lifted for just a second. And what's there is real. Maybe it's a vision of the next world, but I can see it. You can see it, but you can never get there without our help. Get there? What do you mean? Our offer. Maybe we can get you there in return for your completing the mission. A beat. They'll let you die. I'll shut off your life support, and you'll simply slip away. Just like the good lord intended you to do a few months back. A fearful beat, negotiating over his own soul. You'd never do it. You wouldn't have to. You could just flip the switch and start me back up again, unaware. For all I know, you've made this deal with me before. Actually, we haven't. Your operational awareness has become too great. If you've found out the truth about yourself once, you might do so again. As for source code, I'm sure we can find other servicemen coming back from overseas with wounds just like yours. Patronizing. Do you have the courage to serve your country one final time? Coulter's eyes bore into Rutledge. I'm going to find you, Rutledge. Someday. Somewhere. Rutledge, retreating from the confrontation. The display screen on the detonator was a useful and exciting insight you made. This time, make it pay off. Get the information on the screen, but let the bomb explode. We need the force of the explosion to help integrate you quickly back into the present. The source code machinery is already beginning to hum. Rutledge excitedly keying in system commands. You hear me? Somehow I'm gonna find you. I doubt that. There's barely time for Coulter to grab onto the harness restraints before the machinery goes into a deafening howl. Thunk. Coulter's body convulses and goes limp. Unconscious, he sags in his seat, held in by the harness. 
everything switches off and goes dark. A split second later, the capsule comes back to life again, as if the plug were simply put back in. Captain? Coulter jolts awake, disoriented, thrashing to get free. It's okay, calm yourself, you're back. Coulter exhales, shuddering. He's just completed another source code. What happened? The tentacles of the nightmare slowly releasing, replaced by the oppression of being back in the capsule, back in Rutledge's power. Was the bomber's identity on the cell phone? I think so, but there wasn't time to read the screen, and as soon as it rang, the bomb went off. What about the phone itself? Make, model, product identification number? I was able to examine the phone without separating it from the detonator, which I was instructed not to do. His delivery is different now, impersonal and distant. Did you make any other progress? What in heck's name did you do for those 17 minutes? Coulter does not answer. The machinery again starts up. Coulter tenses, bewildered. His eyes dart accusingly to the screen. Wait, what are you... Thunk. Again he convulses and goes limp. Click. Darkness. Everything powers down and back up again. Controls, monitor, machinery. Coulter groans and opens his eyes, gripped by another terror. Returning from yet another trip on the train. Another bomb blast. Death and resurrection. Rutledge looks in on him with impatience. We can do this all day until you get it right. Please, I, I don't feel good. I don't doubt it. Who's the bomber? I don't know. I honestly, I can't. I can't. The humming again. He's helpless. An insect on a pin. Coulter tears at his restraints, ready to bash his brains out against the controls. He screams. And in sudden freedom surges up out of his seat on the train with a cry. Around him, startled passengers look over in confusion. Hey! Coulter, back in his navy jacket, slacks, and a shirt, has pitched forward into Christina. You want to get off me? The overweight man, wide-eyed in surprise, has his finger poised to open his can of soda. Go ahead, open your fucking soda! Thksh! The overweight man complies. Some half-muttered reproaches, then most people go back to what they were doing. What's wrong with you anyway? She glares at him as he stands up. He can't respond. Despair surges through him. He stumbles off down the aisle. But where can he go? There's no freedom, no escape. Imprisoned in both worlds. From her seat, Christina watches him go, sensing the torment in him. Coulter is slumped in a corner. Christina appears and taps him on the shoulder. You okay? He eyes her furtively, like a caveman who's never seen another human being before. You're not okay. He's ghostly pale. He's sweating profusely. Ma'am, please return to your seat. Footsteps, the sound of jangling keys. Ticket? The conductor takes up position in front of him, as implacable as Rutledge in his way. Ticket, please? He's not feeling well. He still needs a ticket. Coulter makes no move to respond, no more concern for anything. Have it your way, pal. He takes out his book to write Coulter up. Wait, I I'll pay for it. I have no idea where he got on. Full fares, twenty-two fifty. All right, all right. Getting out her wallet, she pays the conductor. He eyes her with disapproval and then shambles off. I see customer service is alive and well on New Jersey Transit. Why did you just do that? The ticket? I don't know, you looked a little lost. The gratitude in his look makes her self-conscious. She turns to go. Will you do me a favor? What's that? Get off the train. What? Now approaching Newark Station. Newark Station, next stop. Please, just get off the train. Her puzzled look. The train begins to slow down. This isn't my stop. 
You shouldn't have been on this train, Christina. You should be living another life, not spending and answering phones for lawyers. How do you... A group of passengers approaches the exit area. We've seen them before. Derek, the old man, the college kid, the small encounters, shuffling around, positioning at the doors, the college kid tapping Derek on the arm, holding out Derek's wallet. Hey, you dropped this. Derek, relieved, takes it back. Wow, thanks. The train stops, the doors open. Newark Station. Derek, the old man, and the college kid get off. A second later, Guzman bursts past them, making his nauseated run for the station, leaving just Coulter and Christina there. The doors stand open, invitingly. Everyone has a destiny, and this isn't yours. He steps out onto the platform, holds out his hand for her to join him, a coaxing look. She's incredulous. This guy, his words, this whole moment. Who in the world are you? Just do it. Stop being afraid. Believe in yourself. He waits for her, only two steps away. All aboard. Doors are closing. She blinks and the spell breaks. Those two steps prove to be too much. Leave me alone. She retreats back into the car. Coulter is heartbroken. About to pursue her, he happens to look over and see Derek. Instead of going directly to the station house, Derek continues walking down the platform alongside the train, as if intending to board further down. And then it happens. With a quick motion, Derek tosses something through an open door of another car and then heads quickly away toward the station house. With no time to think, Coulter slips back on board just as the doors slide shut. The train begins moving and Christina is nowhere in sight. This is a New York bound train. Next stop, New York Penn Station. Intrigued, Coulter leaves the exit door area. He strides down the aisle of the second car and reaches the next set of exit doors, but there's nothing there. Whatever Derek tossed inside is gone. Did someone pick it up? Coulter looks up the aisle and then the other way into the next car. No one is there. Once more, he examines the exit area and gets down on his knees. Then he spots it, an opening between the floor and one of the wall panels only a few inches high. And there, something lies. Coulter slides it out. Derek's wallet, intentionally left here, the same wallet the college kid gave back to Derek earlier. Opening it, Coulter pulls out Derek's driver's license. The source code has finished. The monitor shows just the empty chair. Finally, Rutledge returns to his seat. They've searched the wreckage and found the wallet. It was under the wall panel, just as you said. An awkward dynamic between them. They despise each other, but have to work together. Believe me, he's our guy. He tossed his own wallet back on the train. The only reason he would do that is... Rutledge finishes his thought. As if he wanted us to think he died in the explosion. I know. We looked into his profile. Derek Frost is a commodities trader with a wife, two children, and a promotion one month old. He's an emergency preparedness volunteer on his office floor, for God's sake. You saw that terrorist video. They said it was one of us. One of our own. If he really is the one... You can find out the rest of his plan. How? By any means necessary. There is no Geneva Convention in the source code. Torture him, you mean? Find out the plan, he shrugs, before it happens here. And then I'll let you die. Their grisly bargain. In the conductor's apartment, there's a fully loaded 9mm handgun locked in a safe. Think you can remember the combination? Christina is absorbed in her sketchbook. Across from her, Coulter watches. A stranger to her again. It hurts too much. She feels his eyes on her. When she looks up, he's gone. As Guzman exits the bathroom, he almost crashes into Coulter, who's waiting right there. Excuse me. Assalamu alaikum.
Squeezing past, Guzman does a double take to hear the standard Arabic reply. Reaching into the overhead crawl space, Coulter once again unhooks the cell phone detonator from the bomb. Sitting down on the toilet seat, he dials 411 on the cell phone. What listing? The New York Times. Christina's cell phone rings, and she gets it out. Hello? Christina, it's Stephanie. Where are you right now? I'm going to work. Why? The strangest thing. The phone rang at my desk, and some guy I don't know said the train you're on isn't safe and that you should get off at the next stop. And then he hung up. What? The train begins to slow down. Now approaching Newark Station. Newark Station, next stop. I don't understand. Maybe you should get off. Are you okay? The station platform slides into view. I'm fine. Everything's normal. Is there something on the news? Some kind of alert? Nothing that I've heard. The train pulls to a stop and passengers begin to get off. Newark Station. Christina is out of her seat debating. I think you should get off. I'll be late for work. The hell with work, Christina. You hate that job anyway. It's probably a joke. A weirdo guy from somewhere. She sees Coulter down the exit area and they lock eyes. Somehow she knows he made the call. Coulter quickly disappears into another car. The doors stand open to the platform. Just then, Derek's wallet goes skidding back on board, disappearing under the wall panel. A second later, Coulter reaches the exit area. All aboard, doors are closing. The train doors shut. Coulter is now out on the platform. Christina is not there. Concerned, walking quickly forward, Coulter looks through the windows and finds her staring back at him, still on the train. A strange moment between the two of them. Once again, he's failed to save her. They watch each other for as long as possible until the train pulls away. As the train speeds up, Christina sits down again, lowering her phone. Did you get off the... No, I'll call you back. She hangs up, disturbed, as if she's failed some test. But what test? Why this weird feeling? This is a New York-bound train. Next stop, New York Penn Station. The train speeds up. Anxiety creeps onto her face. Looking around, the tranquility of the passengers begins to seem ominous, hinting that she's made the wrong choice. In the train conductor's compartment, the conductor enters, about to pour himself a cup of coffee, when the metal door to the safe has been opened. Inside the quiet lobby of the Newark station, Derek is heading for the outer doors to the parking lot. Derek Frost. Coulter is walking toward him, holding up Derek's wallet. You forgot something? Gosh, is that my wallet? As he goes to take it, Coulter grabs him. Behind the closed door at the stall end comes the sound of Guzman vomiting. Bang! The men's room door flies open and Coulter drags Derek inside. What the hell, man? Hey, what the hell? You see this? Coulter pulls out the detonator cell phone, the one he took off the bomb. He holds it inches from Derek's face. Now you can't blow it up. What is this? Get away from me! The barrel of a 9mm pistol aimed right at him. Believe me, I'm very accurate with one of these things. Jesus! Derek raises his hands, sweating, all fright, like a decent man terrorized. It gives Coulter pause. Does he have the right guy? A toilet flushes. The last stall door opens and Guzman emerges. He stops cold as Coulter swings the pistol at him. Stay there, my man. Don't hurt me. Stop acting, for Christ's sake. Keep my wallet. Take my watch. Take anything you want. Unprompted, Guzman takes out his own wallet and sets it on the counter. Calmer than Derek. He's accustomed to trouble. There. Now you have two wallets. Take them and go. Shut up. Tensing. This isn't supposed to happen like this. Please, I have a family. What about the other passengers? Don't you think they had families? 
Hey, uh, what is this about? This man is a terrorist. He planted a bomb on the train. Derek half laughs. What? Click. Coulter pulls back the hammer and savagely jams the barrel of the pistol into Derek's cheek. What's the next attack? Who else are you going to kill today, huh? Derek in tears. Oh, God. Guzman takes a step toward Coulter. One more step, asshole. Don't treat him like this. He's not an animal, and neither are you. Listen to him. For God's sake, I'm not a terrorist. A urine stain spreads on Derek's pants. He looks down, ashamed. Coulter keeps the gun on him. Piss all you want. You took eighty million dollars to kill hundreds of people today. Eighty million dollars? I swear to you. Then what about the wallet, huh? Why the fuck did you twice try to leave your wallet on board? I... I... Time's up. What is it? What is the next attack? So help me, I'll put this bullet through your brain. I don't know what you're talking about. I'm gonna do it. Tightening his finger around the trigger, tears are streaming down Derek's face, but he's not going to talk. I would never hurt anyone. I have a family. I guess you'll have to kill me. But Coulter can't. He can't shoot him. He lowers the gun. Disgusted with himself, why can't he do it? You see, you are a human being. Speaking gently, trying to calm him, even as Coulter feels like he's failed. This can be worked out. We can listen to each other. The temperature is cooling. Derek nodding with him. Anything you want, please. The detonator's cell phone rings, startling all of them. Confused, he answers the phone. Hello? Who is this? Christina? Are you the guy who was sitting across from me on the train? Coulter looks at his watch. The countdown passes three minutes. How can you be calling this number? My friend had it from when you called her to try and get me off the train. Who are you and what do you want? Derek and Guzman cautiously lower their hands, watching in confusion. I was trying to warn you. About what? I'm not sure that it matters now. Talk to me. I feel that something terrible is going to happen. Do I need to get off the train? Am I going to die? He can hear the background noise of the train on the other end. I'm right here, okay? Don't be afraid. Why didn't I get off the train? I knew I should have driven in today. But then there's bridges, right? You never know when they'll be jammed. That stirs something in the back of Coulter's mind. What did you say? The bridges. You just never know when they'll be jammed. His heart starts racing. He flashes back on the train earlier, Derek in his seat on his cell phone, Coulter nearby overhearing him. Trust me, by one o'clock the bridge is going to be jammed. Coulter looks to Derek. His stomach sinks. By one o'clock the bridge is going to be jammed. That's what you said. You knew. You knew there was going to be an evacuation. You knew before it happened. All those people walking across the... The realization hits. They're going to bomb the bridges while they're full of people. A slight flicker travels on Derek's face like a disturbance on a surface of deep water. What are you talking about? Who's going to... Over the phone comes the horn from the passing freight train. Coulter presses the phone to his ear, trying to hear her. Christina, just hang in there. You'll be okay. A hand closes over his gun. Before Coulter can react, Derek turns the gun back into him. Blam, blam. He shoots Coulter twice in the chest. Coulter staggers back, slumped to his knees. Guzman cries out, making a run for Derek, who spins and shoots Guzman dead. Spent shell casings roll to a stop on the tile floor. A terrible silence. What's happening? Are you okay? Are you there? Derek picks up the phone and terminates the call. He coldly evaluates the two men dying in pools of blood, and then calmly walks out. As the life slips from Coulter's eyes, he manages to focus on his beeping watch. The 17 minutes have run out, and the world bleaches white. 
In the haze comes the mystical vision again, but deeper in. The stone wall now curves over our head, becoming a tunnel. Christina walks away from us, down into the tunnel. The far end is ablaze in white light. We try calling to her, but our voice is weak and faint. She continues toward the light, and we do not follow. Inside the isolation unit, the monitor is dark. Everything is still. Coulter in his seat. For long seconds, we watch his face. A jarring transition. We are now away from Coulter's point of view, in the real physical environment of the Source Code Operations Center. Military and civilian personnel work amid mysterious scientific equipment. Rutledge talks on a wall phone, like a team player serving his country. Yes, we appreciate that. I just hope the information has come in time to clear the bridges. Thank you, sir. When he hangs up, he turns to Goodwin and a few other technicians. Naked ambition courses through him. Whether or not they can stop the bridge attack, we came up with the intelligence. And that virtually assures all of our futures. This is just the beginning, guys. You did a great job, Goodwin. You operated our captain with skill and professionalism. What's that you have? Goodwin opens an envelope and slides out a citation. The army investigated Coulter's helicopter crash in Iraq. Apparently he stayed behind to fly protective cover for a disabled convoy until he ran out of fuel. What's this then? Some kind of posthumous reprimand for reckless flying? No. It's the Silver Star. Something in Goodwin's voice momentarily checks Rutledge's breezy good humor. Send it to his father. It'll ease the pain of his son's death. I thought I might inform the captain of the citation. Better not. We can't risk acquainting him with the citation, in case the memory wipe isn't entirely clean. The memory wipe? A technician. I thought we were going to let him die. I know, I know, but now the Director of National Intelligence is sure to want a closer look at our program, and until we train up another candidate, we'll need to keep Coulter around to demonstrate it. Oh. This thing is much bigger than any one of us. Goodwin, please clear Coulter's memories and reinitialize source code. Rutledge walks away. The technician gives Goodwin a look of disgust. Goodwin carefully places the citation into the envelope. Mission control, panels, consoles, and screens. Goodwin takes a seat at his workstation. He swings a microphone up and goes to flip a switch, and then stops. Unsure how to proceed, he looks down at the envelope with the citation in it. Inside the capsule of the isolation unit, the silence continues. Coulter thinks to himself. The monitor then comes on. Captain, this is beleaguered castle. Acknowledge transmission. Rutledge walks by himself, reflecting, pleased with himself. Under his breath, he acknowledges the praises he's imagining in his head. Thank you, sir. I appreciate your faith in me. It's a great day for our country. Coulter looks out at Goodwin. A beat of difficult silence. How are you feeling? Are you comfortable? Just do it. Come again? Just do it. I knew they wouldn't let me die. At least you can make me forget all of this. I hope. Goodwin stares at his hands, unmoving. What are you waiting for? You're just doing your job. I would do the same thing if I was you. At least you've got a shot at saving those people on the bridges. I doubt it. You don't think it'll save them? No, I meant I doubt you'd be doing this if you were me. An unusually personal statement coming from Goodwin. Look, someone had to be where you're sitting and someone had to be in here. Turned out it was you and me. Just do it. I'm tired. Would you like to see Christina again one last time? Coulter is not sure he heard him right. I don't understand. Seventeen minutes. That's all I could give you. No mission to fulfill. 
Just the two of you. Coulter is stunned. Why would you do that? As a favor. One prisoner to another. Prisoner? You were right. About me. About source code. We've kept too much from each other. An odd sensation comes over Coulter. I usually report in at 0600. Today, I was there early. I was there when the call came in. Your call. His call? They share a long look. No, there's no way you could have... Goodwin just smiles. Coulter protests. How? The source code was a parallel world, and you told me so. It's hermetically sealed. Nothing I did on that train would have any effect on this reality. You were on the train. I was not. But... I don't know if any bleed-through could occur. The implications would be staggering. That's why you were told to avoid unduly influencing events. You're saying I could have saved those people? No, not in our world. The time currents are too strong. But minor alterations here and there... A phone call, say, those might slip through. We don't know for sure. But you proved it. Coulter is thunderstruck, unable to grasp it. I've been thinking about the things you said on that call. As the day passed, the more I understood them. And now I guess we've caught up to each other. Man, just when I think I understand this. There's not much time. They think I'm reinitializing the system. One last look at her. That's all I can give you. If that. They'll nail your ass for this. If I had any feelings, I'd worry about that. But as you've maintained, I do not. The strange path of their relationship. Ending at last. A simple, grudging respect. Roger that. The machinery begins to hum. This is Beleaguered Castle signing off. Acknowledge final transmission. Final transmission acknowledged. Thank you, Goodwin. Goodwin interrupts his preparation for a last look at Coulter. The noise gets louder. The capsule begins to shake. Coulter touches the monitor, his fingers imparting to the last image of his world a quiet benediction. Sipping a cup of coffee, Rutledge lingers at a window, contemplating his future. Dr. Rutledge Extension 16 over the intercom. Blinking out of his reverie, he goes over to the wall phone and punches an extension. This is Rutledge. He listens. His face darkens. Shit! He slams down the phone and starts running. Coulter is back on the train. It's morning again, 17 minutes before the destruction. He's back in the Navy blazer, the slacks. The commuters, caught up on their individual concerns, ignore Coulter, but he looks on them with an appreciation approaching joy. For a moment he just sits there, simply being alive in this world, attuned to the motion of the train, the sun on his face, and across from him, oblivious, working away on her sketch pad, is Christina, the best sight of all. In the engineering lab, banks of machinery are running. Rutledge comes charging in, flustered and barking questions. What is this? Who authorized this? We don't know, sir, but source code is up and running again. Where is Goodwin? The chair at the console is empty. No idea, sir. A digital clock ticks down from 17 minutes. 1528, 1527, 1526... What the hell is he doing? Coulter drinks in the sight of Christina. Finally, he gets up and walks off down the aisle. As soon as he's gone, Christina looks up. She's observed his interest in her. Doesn't quite know what to make of it. Coulter is by himself in the exit door area. From his jacket, he takes out a cell phone. We go close on the cell phone screen. He dials 911. The call connects. 911, what is the nature of your emergency? Rutledge watches the computers churn. Shut it down. Sir, shut down the source code right now. The technician hesitates. Fine, I'll do it myself. 
Rutledge sits down at the controls. I wouldn't do that. Rutledge gives a dismissive snort, and yet he pauses. And why not? We've never interrupted source code in mid-run. We'd have to literally pull the plug. It could damage the processors. Let it finish, then. No harm in that, I guess. All of you are in deep shit, I promise you. As for Goodwin, he'll never make it off this base. Rutledge picks up a phone. I don't think that's where he's headed. Rutledge considers, and then catches on. He wouldn't. He looks up at the technician, and grows more and more uneasy, snapping his attention back to the countdown clock, which reads 1242. Before it hits 1241, Rutledge is already out of his chair and running for the door. Seal the ICU! I want a detachment of MPs meeting me on the way there! Coulter walks down the aisle of the train and looks at his watch. Twelve minutes, forty seconds. The train begins to slow down. Now approaching Newark Station. Newark Station, next stop. The computer engineer begins to wake up. As he does, Coulter passes by, deftly slipping the borrowed cell phone back into the engineer's hand without being noticed. Derek picks up his things. We see him hide his wallet into a gap in the seat cushion and get up. The college kid, also getting up, notices Derek's wallet, picks it up and hurries after him. Hey, you dropped this. Wow, thanks. Keeping his composure, Derek accepts the wallet. Coulter steps aside, allowing them to pass, allowing it all to happen. The station slides into view, no one on the platform. Rutledge furiously descends the stairs, shoving people out of the way. He runs up to a locked door and swipes his access card through the scanner. It comes up red. What? He tries again. Red. The door stays locked. The train comes to a halt. Unlike before, the doors stay shut for several seconds longer than usual. Derek waits quietly at the doors. And finally they open. Derek steps out onto the platform, together with the old man, the college kid, and Guzman. Newark Station. Coulter remains on board, standing at the exit area watching. As usual, Derek quickly flips his wallet onto the next car and starts toward the station house. Guzman is ahead of him, already pushing open the doors to the station. All is quiet, perhaps too quiet. Derek approaches the station and sees, in the station lobby are police officers. Derek's jaw tightens. He changes course, heading instead for an outdoor stairwell. Coming up the stairs, however, are more police officers. Wheeling around, Derek heads the other way, walking faster, but keeping his head and not running, not panicking. The train, oddly, is still sitting there. As he nears the other end of the platform, more officers appear from behind columns, cutting off his escape. The police are coming from all sides, converging on the platform, yet no one panics and no one runs, until the police commander calls out, Derek Frost! Derek goes to get back on the train. The doors, however, slide shut in his face. Through the closed doors, Derek looks in at Coulter still on the train. They stare at one another through the window. Mr. Frost, please turn to face us. An entire phalanx of police officers is on the platform. Of course, what is this about? Unseen by the officers, Derek has taken out his cell phone and is dialing it as he turns around. The police approach cautiously. Place your hands in the air. My pleasure. Raising his hand, he pushes send on his phone. On board the train, there's a ringing. The detonator phone has been removed from the bomb, now rings harmlessly in the hand of the train's security officer. The restroom door is open and swarmed with conductors, examining the bomb. On the platform, the officers tackle Derek, subduing him. Passengers watch at the windows, mesmerized. Once again, please return to your seats, ladies and gentlemen. No way. No one is moving from the windows. Except for Coulter, who stands off by himself. The first look of satisfaction we've ever seen on his face. An alarm is going off, 
in an underground bunker of Nellis Air Force Base. At the locked door, an Air Force locksmith is in the process of disabling the keypad. Rutledge paces, livid. I want to know who reprogrammed this lock, and if you don't get this open in ten seconds, I'll see that you're busted back down to private. I'm already a private, sir. Just open it. A man's life is at stake. The keypad goes green, and the pressure lock releases. Rutledge tears open the door. Armed military police clatter down the steps. Goodwin enters. He locks another door behind him. He's shaken, but nevertheless going forward. In the chamber, three medics monitor gauges and screens. One of them stands up to block his way. Sorry, I can't let you pass. Goodwin removes the patch on his uniform to reveal the insignia of a major. Step aside. That's an order. We all know your rank, Goodwin, but I have explicit orders from Rutledge not to... Bam! Goodwin drops the medic with a splintering headbutt. I'm glad you know my rank. Were you also aware I'm in the Special Forces? The train has been evacuated as police investigators search the rest of the cars. Hordes of passengers fill the platform as conductors try to herd them toward the station. Ladies and gentlemen, rail service has been cancelled. Please clear the platform and proceed into the station. New Jersey Transit apologizes for the inconvenience. Police cars parked everywhere. Two detectives are questioning the computer engineer. So you have no idea how your cell phone was used to call in the tip? No! People mill about waiting for the buses, groaning and complaining. Christina accosts a passing transit employee. What now? How do we get to work? You guys have buses or something? The transit employee ignores her and walks away. Hey, I'm talking to you! She stands there in exasperation. This whole thing has been designed to thwart her. Nearby, Coulter sits on a bench. Ain't life grand? Looking over, she notices him. Yeah, now I'm going to get fired for being late. Maybe that's a good thing. She gives him a sharp look. In the underground bunker, Rutledge runs, now leading the detachment of MPs. Shoot him if you have to, you hear me? The MPs exchange a look of annoyance at being ordered around by this guy. A heavy inner door has been opened. The beeping of life support systems. The compressions of a ventilator. Goodwin approaches a gurney. A jungle of tubes and lines lead from the gurney into advanced machinery. A somber look on his face. Hello, Captain. As Goodwin edges forward, we reveal the bare foot of someone lying there. A digital timer reads one minute. At the facility's outer door, the locksmith goes to work on another panel as Rutledge and the MPs stand by. Give me 20 seconds. Make it 10. Rutledge looks at his watch. It reads 52 seconds. Coulter's watch also reads 52 seconds. His work is done. He's saved her. He's saved them all. At least this one time. Only she doesn't know that. Christina stands there, arms crossed, scowling at the parking lot. Could this day get any worse? That train was taking you to a place you didn't want to be. But then, you got off. Maybe that's a sign. Yeah, if only. She takes out her cell phone. The stress of her day. I'm calling a cab. Maybe I'll only be somewhat late for work. Coulter watches her. A quiet ache inside. Maybe some people don't want to be saved. In the bunker, the noise from the outer door grows louder. The MPs are only seconds from getting inside. Goodwin moves toward the life support equipment. As he does, we glimpse a horrifying sight. The upper half of Coulter's body, his real body, inside a sterile tent of transparent plastic. His skull has been removed. A massive apparatus has been infused directly into his brain. Goodwin takes a long last look. Thank you for your service. It's time to go home. Goodwin's hand goes to the switch to shut off the life support system. His eyes on the clock. It reads 30 seconds. 
Christina is on the phone, waiting as it dials. Hey! She turns and Coulter gets up. You can do anything you want with your life, starting right now. She's taken aback. He starts walking off. Metro cab dispatch. A long beat as she watches him. Hello? Click. She shuts her phone. Is she crazy? She's baffled by her own action, and by this unusual guy here. Wait! Coulter turns. She crosses her arms, archly. You can't just expect someone to change her life just like that. And at the very least, you'd have to buy that person coffee and explain your reasons. She waits for his response, uneasy at putting herself out there. Coulter's watch ticks down to the final seconds, his last moments in this world. He only has enough time for a final look of reassurance. Maybe some other time. Disappointment flickers on her face. She turns to go. Behind her is a stone wall, and a bicycle is parked against it. Coulter's breath catches in his throat. This is it. This is the mysterious scene he has been seeing. His watch hits zero. In the bunker ICU, the digital timer also hits zero. The outer door opens. Rutledge rushes in, accompanied by MPs. Arrest him! Goodwin backs away from the gurney, hands in the air. The beeping has given way to a monotone. All of Coulter's vital signs have flatlined. He's dying! Rutledge frantically goes to reconnect the machines, but Goodwin has turned off too many of them. Get a medical team in here! Move! But the MPs just stare at the appalling sight of Coulter's exposed brain. What are you standing there for? Do it! We can save him! No one moves. Rutledge rashly grabs for one of the MP's rifles. I guess force is the only thing you people understand. Back away, sir, now! The MP has leveraged his rifle at Rutledge, who steps back, aghast. His authority has vanished with Coulter's life. Goodwin shuts off the monitors, and silence fills the room. Coulter is dead. Rutledge stares sorrowfully at Coulter's body and then at Goodwin with burning hatred. You're a murderer! Goodwin offers his hands to the MP. Go ahead and arrest me. But the MP does nothing. I'll be around whenever you want me. They part as he walks out of the room, a look of grim satisfaction on his face. Christina walks past the bicycle parked against the stone wall. She's about to enter a tunnel that goes under the tracks, the same tunnel from Coulter's vision. She stops. Something tells her to turn around. The bench where Coulter sat is empty, but three feet away, Coulter is standing there. He's still here. Dumbfounded, he looks at his watch. It remains at zero. He looks all around, trees stirring in the breeze. A bird flies overhead, the crowd of passengers outside the station. You okay? Coulter turns to her. How can this be? He's afraid to even speak, as if that alone could break the enchantment. But the world is here. It goes on. That's all he knows. Finally, he swallows, finding his voice. You're right. The least I can do is buy you coffee. This pleases Christina, although she tries not to show it. Okay, well, come on then. Walking forward, he joins her. The two of them disappear down the tunnel. A beautiful morning. The End